As we continue in creation season, our sermon series, Hope for the Trees, we're going to read the teaching of Jesus that the kids just helped us act out from the Gospel of Matthew, as well as a portion of Psalm 1. We are reminded of the wisdom that trees hold and embody for us. First, a reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay beginning with the last, and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought that they would receive more. But each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. We also read the first three verses of Psalm 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on God's law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. May these words be to us our light and our life. Thanks be to God. Those who know me well know that I am a shameless podcast junkie. I sometimes think I should have been born many decades ago because the radio is my preferred mode of media consumption. I love losing myself in a narrative and using my imagination to construct the visuals as this compelling story washes over me. And there's one podcast that's my absolute favorite, Reply All, a podcast about the internet. The creators of the show get their inspiration from weird happenings all over the internet and follow their questions about 10 steps farther than a reasonable person would. They end up discovering all kinds of fascinating people and strange subcultures, beautiful glimpses of ordinary humanity. This week, Reply All producer Fia Benin traveled down the proverbial rabbit hole of a game that used to be on the web but was taken down long ago, part of a generation of games in the early 2000s. This one was called Bunny How We First Met. In the game, you're a bunny, and your goal is to make as much money as possible so you can entice this lady bunny to love you. You purchase other bunnies to work in your lumber yards and gold mines. And the more money you make, the more you appeal to that lady bunny you're trying to court and eventually marry. The story falls apart when you meet another bunny, one who loves you without all this money, and you have to figure out how to navigate the conflict of values that ensues. 
Do you follow convention and expectations, or do you follow your heart? The Reply All folks tracked down the creator of the game, wondering uh, what was going on in the mind of a person who would create something so strange, uh, and found out that it was his experience planning his own wedding that led him to design it. His wedding showed the consumerism of our culture. Uh, it made apparent in this process that if we make more and have more and do more, that our culture tells us somehow we're more worthy of love. And this game is certainly a weird way of expressing that sentiment, but also strangely powerful. Of course, in real life, it's not as simple as dropping little gold mines around a cartoon island. But our culture sends us such similar messages. The harder we work, the more we make. The more we make, the more we are worth as human beings. Jesus reminds us that this cultural assumption has been operating for time immemorial. He tells the story of laborers working in a field. Some of the workers are lucky. They get hired early in the day. And that's just what they are. They're, they're lucky. All the workers had been in the marketplace just waiting to be hired since early in the morning. And the lucky ones were picked up first thing. And this one landowner keeps returning to the marketplace to hire more workers, and at the end of the day, no matter how long they've worked, he pays them the exact same wage. What's striking to me about this passage is how readily the laborers buy into the system. How willing they are to say, well, of course, the people who work more deserve more. That's only fair. How easy it is to forget that they could have been the unlucky ones, waiting all day to be hired through no fault of their own. How quickly they acquiesce to this idea that their value as human beings depends on how much they can produce and how long and hard they work. The very idea that they could have equal value simply because they're all human beings feels like an injustice. But isn't that true for us too? It plays out so often in our national debates plays out in the immigration debates as a nation when we praise and celebrate DACA students working as developers at Apple while in the same breath condemning immigrants working low-wage jobs and relying on social safety nets to survive. This idea of worthy and unworthy immigrants. It plays out in our national conversation about those very social safety nets when we criticize people who spend food stamps on junk food because God forbid a person in poverty ever have a treat. This idea of worthy and unworthy people living in poverty. It plays out in media coverage of people living with disabilities. We love the story of the person with disabilities who conquers all and inspires us. We're very comfortable erasing the much more common story of people with disabilities who may never do something quote unquote inspiring. This idea of worthy and unworthy people. But Jesus says, no, there is no worthy and unworthy in the kingdom of God. No matter what hand you've been dealt, you are more than enough. You do more than enough. You are a recipient of all of God's love, and so is everyone else. And yet, we still live within this culture that values high production and ceaseless work, looking out for ourselves first. So how do we live within that tension? Well, we read from Psalm 1 today that those who delight in God are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. Perhaps the trees give us a clue about how to exist within our culture that pushes us to do and have and be more, where nothing is ever enough. See, the trees yield fruit in their season, or at least deciduous ones do. 
And see, I've, I've known about this cycle of seasons all my life, of course, but I'd never considered the mechanism by which this seasonal cyclical process occurs. Trees go dormant for the same reason that animals hibernate. They slow down to conserve energy so that as the seasons change, they can continue to sustain themselves. As fall approaches, trees begin to produce a chemical called ABA, an acid which stops cells from dividing. That means that we get this gorgeous show of leaves changing colors, and uh, we also get the immense chore of raking them all up. But, uh, but there's another process going on that's less visible. The tree's metabolism slows so that only its essential functions are operating. In the article I read about this, for you scientists, I hope I'm getting the science right, uh, the, the article I read about this said that it's possible to stop this process from happening. You can bring trees indoors to a climate controlled location, um, but it's not good for the tree. If a tree misses enough dormancy cycles, the tree is more likely to get sick and die. Nothing in nature is expected to be fruitful constantly. There's no such thing as an eternal summer. Even for the trees that don't lose their leaves, they slow down their consumption and production in the winter months. They respond to the changing cycles of our planet. Less sun, less food production, less food production, less activity. Animals too hibernate to conserve energy. But we as humans in this fast-paced world, we don't take the same kind of dormancy period. We don't often slow down. We are pushed to be constantly productive. A recent study by Willis Towers Watson shows that a quarter of the current American workforce believes they won't be able to retire until at least age 70. And 5% of our workforce doesn't believe they will ever be able to retire. Think about that. Project Time Off has shown through their research that 55% of Americans don't use all their vacation time, and the average number of vacation days taken per year has decreased by a full week since 1978. And that's just surveying people who have paid time off. Many people don't have that luxury. We are one of the last countries to have our health insurance coverage tied to our employment. We are at risk of losing crucial supports within that system every time one of these new ACA repeal plans comes up. We're expected to work constantly without periods of unemployment if we want to be considered worthy of health care. There's something wrong with that picture. Jesus says that this productivity calculus is antithetical to the kingdom of God. Each worker in the vineyard, no matter how many hours he or she has worked, gets the exact same wage. No exceptions. It is a subversive thing to say that we have more than enough, that we do more than enough, that we are more than enough, when our culture constantly pushes us for more but the tree knows better. UCC minister Matt Fitzgerald reminded me this week in his daily devotional about H. Richard Niebuhr's Christian Century column from 1932 titled The Grace of Doing Nothing. In the face of terrible violence that led to the Second World War, Niebuhr writes that there are several types of inaction. Not all of them are the right choice in every moment, but there's this kind of grace-filled inaction that arises from knowing that we have done enough and God's got the rest. Niebuhr reminds us that when we believe we have to keep doing and doing and doing until it's all done, we're trying to play God. We're denying that there is value in rest, in Sabbath, and saying that we've done enough and it's time to let God take over. Jesus reminds us in his teaching about the kingdom of heaven that we are created for generosity. We're created for love. 
We do not hold value in this world or in God's because of our productivity. Each and every living being on this planet is valuable simply because we belong to one another and we belong to God. Next week, we are going to plant a black cherry tree out in our west lawn. There's been a tree that's lived there for many years. It has now died. It will be relegated to climbing status only. And the Caring for Creation Committee chose the black cherry tree, also known as Prunus serotina, because it's a native species here in east central Minnesota. The evolution of genera, I learned this week that's the plural of genus, uh, and species is a fascinating example of how we are created for relationship. Moths and butterflies have evolved to feed only off of certain genera of trees, which correspond to their local environments. This black cherry tree, which is native to our region, will support native moths and butterflies. This tree, simply by its existence, creates a habitat where life can flourish. What beautiful abundance and in interdependence. Perhaps we can learn from our friends, the trees. We are allowed, maybe even required, to have seasons of dormancy in addition to seasons of fruitfulness. And that fruitfulness is not reflected in how much money we make or the accomplishments we rack up, but in how we love one another. We are called to relationship where we support one another's flourishing. And above all, our friends, the trees, remind us that we are more than enough. Thanks be to God. Amen.